Hello, and welcome to Line Edit, a video series about the craft of writing about academic ideas for a broad, popular audience. My name is James Ryerson, and I'll be your host. So who am I? Uh, I've been an editor at the New York Times since 2003, first uh, at the Sunday Magazine, and now at the Opinion Pages. Over the years, I have worked with every kind of writer, uh, dealing with every kind of topic um, that you can imagine. Um, but I've specialized in working with academics uh, and scholars who are looking to get their ideas out um, in our pages. And um, that's uh, what we're going to be talking about today. The line edit uh, video series here uh, can be watched on its own, uh, and you can learn from it. Um, but it's worth noting that it's a, it's a sister uh, effort uh, with a, something called the line edit podcast, uh, in which I have long conversations with academics about pieces that they've written for me. Um, in those podcasts, we can talk uh, very fruitfully about the editorial relationship and about a lot of issues that come up in the editing process. But one thing we can't talk about uh, or really can't demonstrate uh, are the really small uh, changes that happen on the page. Uh, you know, sometimes that's not such a small change. It's cutting out a huge chunk of a piece. But a lot of times it's uh, changing a sentence or adding a sentence or even just changing a word or two in ways that are really critical to what makes a first draft become a final piece. And that's what we're hoping to do here on these, um, on these video uh, line edits. Uh, how did this all come about? Uh, I should explain that uh, a couple years ago I started teaching weekend writing workshops for academics looking to do just this kind of popular writing. And one piece of feedback that I got was that in addition to wanting to hear my perspective as an editor, um, they were kind of craving the perspective of, of people who had gone through the process, people who had written a lot, or even people who had just written one time. Um, they wanted to know what that was like, uh, and so we started doing the podcast interviews so we could bring in both perspectives, editor and writer. Uh, before we get underway, uh, special thanks to the John Templeton Foundation and especially to its public engagement team, uh, without whom the workshops, the podcasts, and this video series uh, wouldn't be possible. Uh, on this episode, uh, I'll be taking a close look at a piece uh, by the philosopher Matthew Liao, who uh, dire directs the Center for Bioethics at New York University. Uh, he wrote a fantastic piece for me in November of 2018 uh, called, uh, Do We Have a Moral Duty to Leave Facebook? Um, it was a very popular piece with readers. Um, it was a very uh, timely piece uh, given the news cycle, uh, and he offered a perspective as an academic philosopher um, that, uh, on the one hand, I think people were craving, that people wanted to know what their relationship to Facebook should be as they learned more things about its behavior. Uh, and at the same time, it was uh, you know, a perspective as an academic philosopher that um, uh, you really couldn't find in many other publications, uh, and uh, you couldn't find in, in academic publications either. Um, uh, one of the interesting things about this piece um, is that uh, it, it really had a journalistic life cycle. You know, we had a, uh, a, a, you know, we decided we wanted this piece, my boss and I, on a Monday, uh, and I reached out uh, to Matthew on a Monday, and I told him we needed a piece in 24 to 48 hours, uh, and that we would publish it um, in, in, in print and online uh, that, that weekend. Um, and uh, that's something journalists are very comfortable doing, um, but it's not something that academics uh, are often comfortable doing. And even academics who publish with me, we're not typically rushing things into print. We usually feel like we have uh, what we call evergreen stories. Uh, if you're writing a piece about the nature of the emotions, uh, we can run that this week, and we can run that the following week, we can run that in six months. But this was a piece we wanted at a particular time. Um, so I, I commissioned this piece on a Monday. Uh, I emailed Matthew on a Monday. He got right back to me, said he was interested in it. Um, I asked him for the piece in 24 hours. I think he bargained for 48, and I told him that was fine as long as he could get it to me that Wednesday morning. Um, uh, and he filed it. Uh, and uh, it was quite good. I knew it was what I was looking for, and I was very excited. Uh, I grabbed him on the phone for a few minutes and just sort of talked through what the editorial process would be, because I knew it was going to be rather rushed, and I wanted him to be prepared for that. Um, and I also gave him a few thoughts uh, about uh, my initial reaction to the piece, and he quickly made a few adjustments and sent it to me. Um, and then within four, or five, six hours, I had done an edit, um, which I got back to him, and he pretty much signed off on it. Uh, and after that, we were you know, just going through the basic process of copy editing it and getting it ready for publication. 
Um, before we dive into the details of the, that edit, uh, let me first thank uh, Matthew for allowing us to show his work um, in progress uh, on, on this series. Uh, not every academic and in fact not every writer is happy having their first drafts um, made public, um, uh, although nobody should really feel awkward about it. Everyone's first drafts uh, need work. Um, even editors need editors when they write. Uh, but um, nonetheless, it's the mark of a, a very generous uh, writer um, to agree to show this, this work in progress. Um, so let's start uh, taking a look at the, at the piece. Uh, this piece is, as I said earlier, when, it, when, I, when he filed it, when Matthew filed this piece, I, I, um, uh, I, I consider this, uh, you know, basically done. You know, I consider this a, a very clean piece. Uh, I didn't expect to have to do much. I had no anxiety about turning it around in the time frame. Um, but that may come as a surprise to you to hear it described that way when you see it, uh, uh, the, 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 the first draft, and then you see the, the markup of the, of the first edit, because um, if, if you hear a piece described as pretty perfect, pretty much done, you, you don't necessarily expect to see uh, this, much, um, this much tinkering and, and cutting. Um, but, um, but that's, that's pretty, pretty common. Uh, you know, we, um, we're, we're in a, bit of a place like the Times, you know, we have very specific uh, uh, ideas about how fast a piece should move along, um, how quickly it should take to get to the main point. Um, there's just a lot of considerations that, unless you've been writing this kind of journalism for a long time, it, it's very uh, unlikely to, you know, and unreasonable to expect anyone to have internalized um, all of these kind of expectations. And in fact, many of these expectations are somewhat arbitrary to a publication. If, if Matthew had written this piece for, um, oh, I don't know, the New Atlantis or something like that, a, a, you know, a quarterly journal, um, they might have been happy to have him uh, write it in a slightly different fashion, but they might have their own uh, ideas about what a piece for them looks like. So um, it's worth emphasizing that it's not like this is the right answer. Uh, this is the New York Times answer to the question, what should this piece look like? Um, uh, the only really big cut that you can see uh, is right at the beginning. Um, this is something that a lot of writers do. I find academics do it in a lot of different contexts. Um, the very first sentence of the piece, Matthew just explains that he's been on Facebook since 2008 and that he's used it um, a lot and uh, he's enjoyed using it. Uh, and then the next paragraph he says, but lately he's started to have reservations. Um, the first paragraph in the original draft um, he spent a lot of time explaining how he has been using Facebook. He uses it to, you know, connect with his old friends. He uses it to uh, coordinate with his, uh, you know, recreational basketball league. He uses it to stay in touch professionally with the people. Uh, that's the kind of thing where he's just completing his thought, um, which is a natural thing to do as a writer. But um, as an editor, publishing a piece like this in the New York Times, I think you can assume that everybody knows what he's talking about when he says he's been using Facebook. People know what Facebook is used for. Um, so there was nothing wrong about Matthew doing that. Um, maybe there would have been a detail in there that was interesting. I would have been able to use it somewhere in the piece. But um, this, to me, that was just a simple edit. Um, uh, the other two edits that I think are worth pointing out, um, uh, up top, they're both additions. They're both things that I added in uh, to the piece um, and asked <coughs> uh, him to take a look at. Uh, this is pretty common uh, in, for editors to do and um, extremely common for editors to do when you're working on a type, uh, type time, uh, short time frame. Um, it doesn't always make sense to describe what you're looking for and ask someone to come up with it because if they don't know exactly what you mean. So often I put in what I think is the sentence I'm looking for, and I always tell writers that they're encouraged to kind of recast it in their own voice or certainly reject it if it's not a view that they have. But um, uh, in both cases, I felt like I was essentially making explicit something that was implicit in the piece, and I wasn't worried about whether he would um, uh, be okay with it. Uh, the first edit I want to draw your attention to is um, uh, in what is now the first paragraph of the piece, that is in the final version. Um, uh, Matthew says he's wondered whether he should delete his Facebook account. Um, and then he says, you know, in light of recent events, um, you know, there seems to be a question about whether you should. Um, I really wanted him to make clear what he meant by should. And w the reason I, I say that is that uh, the whole point of asking him to do this piece was that we wanted a philosopher to do it. We wanted someone who was asking the question about moral duty to leave and in the kind of deepest possible sense. We didn't want someone who said, should you do it because you're annoyed with Facebook, or should you do it because your friends are doing it, or should you do it because any other kind of 
practical reason. We, run, we really wanted to know should in the kind of moral sense. Should you do this? Do you have a duty to do this uh, in light of what's fair and just in the world or something like that? So I really wanted that aspect of the piece to be clear because it's implicit in the piece, which is something academics often do. They, they, they assume something's implicit, so they, they don't make it explicit. But for our readers, they don't know what they're reading. They enter this piece. It could be by anybody. And so I really wanted to signal uh, that you know he's a philosopher. I say, as a philosopher with a special interest in ethics, I am using should in the moral sense. Um, that was an important ad for me. It, it actually doesn't add, I think, anything really substantive to the piece, um, but it really signals what kind of piece this is. Um, so that was one important line edit. Um, and another uh, important sentence that I added uh, comes in the paragraph um, towards the end where Matthew is um, uh, enumerating all the various um, uh, activities that Facebook has been involved in that have uh, elicited concern from its users. Um, Matthew was very uh, uh, clear, rational, calm, methodical in the way he laid all these things out. Um, but he ultimately was going to be concluding that <coughs> he doesn't yet think there's an a duty to leave Facebook, which seemed like an interesting um, uh, conclusion, but it also didn't seem like a particularly sexy conclusion. It's one thing to say, no, you have a moral obligation to stay. It's another thing to say, no, you have a moral obligation to leave. But for him to say, well, these things are kind of adding up and it's not really heading in the right direction, but so far we haven't really crossed that line. And I was looking for a way to make that uh, somewhat middle of the road position a little more dramatic. So I uh, stuck in a, uh, the sentence that reads, uh, while there still appears to be some daylight between Facebook and what is being done on its platform or in its name, darkness is crowding in. To me, that was maybe a little bit of a lurid turn of phrase given Matthew's tone of voice at this point. Um, I would have been happy if he had dialed it back a little bit or if he had amped it up, um, but I wanted some sentence that just summarized everything he had said above in as dramatic a way as possible. The last change uh, I'd like to direct your attention to uh, is in the very last line of the piece, and it's just a one-word change. And uh, what I'm showing you here is my uh, initial uh, query and suggestion to Matthew in his draft. Um, as you can see, he says for now he's staying on Facebook, but if Facebook crosses a line in the future, um, he may indeed, uh, in fact, he says we may indeed all have an obligation to opt out. Uh, this is a small thing, but uh, I, th I thought he was being excessively cautious. It's, it's already an if-then statement. He's already made it conditional that if Facebook crosses some line. Um, so he's not really sticking his neck out too much to just go a little further and say, if they cross that line, we will indeed have a moral obligation to opt out. It's a small thing, but again, in, in the context of a piece with an academic who's being very cautious and who's, who's offering a kind of uh, middle-of-the-road type solution, uh, everything we can do to kind of make this piece as punchy as possible uh, would help. Um, uh, but again, may and will do have different meanings, and I don't try to shove meanings down writers' throats if they don't want them, so um, I make a change like that and I often uh, signal, um, you know, that I'm not insisting on it, but that I think it makes a lot of sense. Just between you and me, if he had, if he had pushed back, I probably would have pushed back again even harder. I think this was a, a natural uh, choice. But um, that's the story of that, a single word change um, that can have a, a, a big impact on, on, the, on how a piece ends and the, the resonance it leaves with its reader. So what are the takeaway lessons here? If, you know, if you're an academic and uh, you are approached by uh, a newspaper editor, uh, who wants um, a piece by you on short notice um, and you file it and you get the edit back. Uh, what are the lessons? Um, one is uh, uh, don't be surprised if you see a lot of red ink. Uh, that's not a sign that the editor doesn't like the piece or thinks you did a bad job. Uh, that's uh, usually a sign that the editor liked the piece quite a bit and is taking the time to work on it, so that's a good sign. Um, another uh, point is, uh, you know, it's okay if you write in your kind of familiar academic voice. No one's asking you to all of a sudden become a different kind of writer. Um, but uh, you, you don't be surprised if, uh, you know, your editor prompts you at least in a couple different places to try out uh, some phrasing or some verbiage that feels a little more dramatic or a little more blunt or a little more florid or whatever it is, a little more something else than your usual voice. Um, that's often just a way to, you know, 
rhetorical effects like that are often very useful in small pieces in ways that they're not really useful in, in larger academic work. So don't be surprised if you see someone pushing you uh, to include sentences that you didn't write that might not sound like sentences you would have written necessarily on your own. Um, you should feel free to push back if the uh, sentiment isn't one you believe in, but I would encourage you to be open to the act of, of, of having different kinds of uh, sentences in your pieces. Um, also, uh, uh, as you write a piece like this, remember that the person who's starting to read it uh, does not know why it was assigned or necessarily even that you're an academic. Uh, they've started in on the piece, and uh, if what you're offering is your perspective as an academic, uh, it's worth signaling what that perspective is. You might say, as a philosopher who studies ethics, I'm using should in the moral sense, which is what I told Matthew to do. You might have to say, as a psychologist, uh, I study this issue um, empirically. Uh, a lot of people write about things just using their own reflections and analysis. And what, the reason we're going to you as a, as a social psychologist is because you've empirically studied this. And I will often uh, ask, uh, academics to make that explicit early on. Everyone's talking about this. I've actually studied it. I actually have some sort of systematic empirical investigation into this thing. Uh, so so uh, keep that in mind as you start writing. Um, it's okay to signal who you are and why your expertise is relevant here. And then finally, uh, uh, you know, don't be surprised if uh, the editor tries to push you to be a little more declarative, a little more emphatic. Um, no editor should uh, push you to say something you don't believe, um, but uh, be mindful that academics are by nature uh, cautious creatures and um, being pushed to be a little more emphatic uh, is often just a way that, to make your point more powerfully, not to make you say something that you don't want to say. Um, and if you ever do get an email from an editor uh, giving you 48 hours to file a piece, you might want to listen to the podcast interview I did with Matthew uh, in which he offers his perspective uh, on this entire process of working with me. Thanks again. Uh, it's been fun talking to you, and uh, so I hope to see you on the next uh, episode of the Line Edit video series.